In this first segment, we're going to look at the pre-CT general considerations, indications and limitations for head and neck CT. As always, irrespective of the anatomical region imaged, it's important to consider the advantages and disadvantages of CT generally. Um, and there are a number of advantages, but there are also disadvantages that include the fact it requires heavy sedation, general anesthesia, it is expensive, and there's occupational safety considerations and ionizing radiation as well. And all of these needs to be balanced when we make our decisions. So it may be that you can ask yourself these questions when you're deciding whether to choose to use it or not. Is CT appropriate for the anatomy I want to image? Will it hopefully answer the clinical question that I have in mind, depending on the, the presentation in front of me? Is it cost effective for the client? Are there any contraindications that I need to consider before using it? And this may be that there's more appropriate imaging modalities to consider first or more cost effective imaging modalities to consider first. Am I happy on my decision that I need to scan the head and neck or are there additional body areas that I should scan alongside it? And if so, what type of acquisition do I need to perform? CT for the head and neck is almost always indicated if there are structural lesions that could explain a patient's clinical signs. And it may be that you can, you can see some or feel structural lesions already from your physical exam. The caveat to that is if clinical signs are primarily related to the central neurological system or cranial nerves, then MRI is always preferable and is the modality of choice. But this may not be the case in head trauma cases, because in those cases, you need to assess the skull, the surrounding soft, soft tissues and the finer soft tissues of the brain itself as well. Other indications include asymmetry of the head, both palpable and visible. Those, are, those patients that have ex experienced head trauma. Patients that have pain when opening their mouth or potentially locked jaw. Any recurrent or severe otitis. Dyspnea related to the upper airways, and that may include stertor or strider, or a facial or cervical masses, some mandibular neck, and neck swelling, but also surgic, surgical planning of previously identified lesions as well. So what information do we need and what options do we have prior to choosing CT? Well, a thorough physical exam is always important, and it may be the identified masses or swellings that can be safely sampled prior to any imaging. If you have clinical signs related to the eyes, then a thorough ocular examination is gonna be important. Or you may have clinical signs related to the oropharynx, and in that case, identified lesions. But it, if a patient isn't compliant, then oropharyngeal examination under sedation or general anesthetic is gonna be very important. And that could be done at the same time uh, or prior to the CT under the same sedation or general anesthetic. Other imaging that we have available to us, well, we have radiographs, but radiographs of the head and neck are difficult to perform effectively and get the right projections. We have a lot of irregular bones that are all overlying each other, and therefore we may miss lesions and they have limited use. For those who do a lot of ocular and periocular work, then ocular and periocular and including retrobulbar ultrasound is very useful and often will be the first line modality. If you have structural lesions associated with the neck, then cervical ultrasound is also useful, but it's operator dependent and it requires a good understanding of the cerv cervical anatomy and the ability to identify the small structures of the neck and know where they're localized. So let's consider this patient that's had some um, head radiographs um, after having trauma. So we have a lateral view and we have a dorsal ventral view. And the lateral view looks relatively normal, apart from the fact we could probably spot this dorsal ventral fissure that's running through the coronoid process of the left mandibular ramus, also seen on the dorsal ventral view here. There's some heterogeneous lucency of the, um, of the mandible and malalignment that overlies the maxilla here on the left side. So there may be further fractures in this location. And I can potentially see a slightly poor defined lucency, lucency in the condylar process of the left mandible as well that may indicate there's fractures in that location. But certainly I feel slightly underconfident here that the radiographs um, are underestimating the degree of um, the injuries and I can't fully assess the, the relationship of the bony injuries to the soft tissue injuries. So I'm going to show you the CT in this case. And in this case, we have the head CT, a high frequency reconstruction in, the bo in a bone window that help us identify the skull bones and their, their injuries. So as we run through the, the head CT in transverse, as we get back to the, to the caudal nasal cavity, we start to see that already we can see a smaller fissure through the right maxilla and the root of, that, of the, the, the tooth in that location. We can start to, be start to better characterize the mandibular fractures, um, the orientation of the fracture lines and displacement of any fracture fragments. We identify further fissures through the maxilla and some of the other teeth, both on the right side and also on the left side here. 
and then we can better characterize the, the um, mandibular ramus fracture that we already, already identified. Also noting that there's some small gas inclusions in the soft tissues that might suggest this is an open fracture. And then we have the comminution of the condyla process and, and there's evidence of communication of the fracture lines with the temporomandibular joint on that side. So the CT provides us with a lot more information. It pro provides us with a 3D assessment of those fractures, identifies further injuries as well. So what are the limitations of CT of the head and neck? Well, the soft tissue contrast resolution is good, but it is limited compared to MRI. So for assessing small soft tissue structures like the brain, um, it becomes limited. Subtle lesions of the brain, cranial nerves, and the cervical spinal cord may be missed. Also, if you have any um, lesions identified, it may still be that you need to sample those lesions and the corresponding lymph nodes in order to get a cytological or histological diagnosis. And that might be ultrasound guided. If you look at these images here, you can see that the vari variation in soft tissue contrast from CT to MRI. So in this case, we have an intraventricular hematoma. In this patient, it's very difficult to differentiate that lesion from the surrounding neuroparenchymal attenuation on CT, whereas the lesion becomes much more conspicuous and the variation in intensity on the different sequences of the, the MRI is very different and enables you to characterize the lesion much better and therefore make a more specific diagnosis. You'll also need to ask yourself the question, what are the considerations that I need to think about to make sure my CT is a success? Well, the patient needs to be straight and positioned in sternal recumbency. We need the head and neck parallel to the table and gantry, and we need to make sure the acquisition field of view is appropriate for the anatomy that we're imaging. If you've identified lesions within the mouth and they're small, then it may be that you need to separate them from the tongue or buccal fold so they're better visualized on CT. It's important to open mouth, the mouth a little to get better air to soft tissue contrast resolution. Um, but we have to take care with cats because we don't want to open the mouth too much and hold it open for too long as we could cause hypoxia to the brain. If you want further information on the VET CT protocols for, protocols for head and neck CT acquisition, then you can review them also. The question you also then need to ask yourself is what are the common CT body area combinations that may arise with the head plus or minus the neck? So that will usually be head, neck and thorax. And certainly that will be important, particularly for respiratory investigations. I usually find it preferable to scan the neck with the thorax as we have a reduced number of images as well. And you don't need the same acquisition parameters that you need for the head in order to, to um, uh, optimise image quality with the thickness of the skull. But ultimately, if there's an overlap between the, the reconstruction field of view and you've got all the anatomy included, then you've, you've, you've covered everything. So thank you very much for listening to this segment. Please do get in contact with us if you have any further questions or want, to, want any more information on this subject. Thank you.